Hello, and welcome to Cannabis Marketing Live, all puff, no fluff. I'm your host, Kendra Losey with Moda Marketing. And today, I'm really excited about our interview. We have Kate Manson, the CEO and founder of Taro CBD and Capsule. And Kate has more than 10 years experience in the cannabis space. And she has worked in a variety of different companies and roles. And now she has her own company and CBD line. And I'm just really excited to talk to her about the creativity required for us for marketing today in the cannabis and CBD space and how it can really help us. So welcome, Kate. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. And so is Pinto. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. He's making her debut. She's there in the background with you there. I just changed the screen so that way they can see. (laughs) Awesome. So Kate, as we're getting started, can you tell us a little bit about how you got started in the cannabis industry? Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's a long-winded story, but essentially it breaks down to, I was in college and I um, needed money and had a lot of friends that were growing cannabis at the time and thought to myself, well, I can absolutely do this too. Um, And so that's kind of where it all started, was in a closet in a house that I rented in college. Um, From there, I started growing on a commercial scale medically. And um, once I saw the shift of the market in Washington State, especially the prices were going down, Um, I looked for a change in what I was doing and I had a degree in marketing and so I uh, actually went to North Corporate for a while and did the whole uh, American office life and uh, while I was there I started getting back into cannabis and here I am it's just been kind of a long couple of years of working in different companies and building you know two of my own companies and um, kind of seeing every facet. I love it. And what made you decide, because you had a marketing agency and you still do actually, what made you decide to um, launch your own brand? Because you guys, she has Tarot CBD as well, which I have this awesome package here. Um, Thank you. So what made you decide to launch? So it was um, clients, and I know that sounds really bad. But I had left a job as a VP of marketing for a company because I was butting heads with, you know, the higher ups and we just weren't really seeing eye to eye. There was a lot of people that weren't involved in cannabis in that company. And so I was like, well, I'm going to go be my own boss because I love this plant so much and it's not just about profit for me. Um, And so then I started taking clients on and personally, this is my own fault. I was really bad at setting boundaries as far as timelines. When you can reach out to me. They scope creeped really bad on, you know, my services. And I was just like completely burnt out and kind of over it. I was yeah. just like, you know what? I left my job to be my own boss. And here I am with three or four bosses at a time that have no boundaries that are calling me at like seven o'clock on a Saturday. And I was just like, I'm done. Like, I'm not doing this. But hindsight is twenty twenty. I also could have been better about setting boundaries. That's always the tricky thing. Um, I just wanted to say we've got if you guys are watching, let us drop a note in the comments and let us know where you're watching. And if you have any questions for Kate or I as we're going through, please drop them in and let us know and we'll get back to you. I can see there's a few of you watching and Annette McDonald, who is, by the way, small plug, the CEO of Easel, which is the um, awesome online graphics company that I use to create the promos for the... <laughs> for this episode and many others. I love it. Um, Okay, so back to Kate. There's a couple things that we were going to talk about that I really wanted to cover right now. Like you're already, we had already planned to talk about the creativity that's required in the cannabis space, but right now is a tremendous time and it's a necessary time for all of us to get more creative with what we're doing. Can you talk about any changes that you're seeing in terms of what you're doing and what your clients might be doing? Um, particularly right now where we're at. For sure. I feel like it's been like two years since we spoke and it's been like 28 days. I know. I looked at it. I was like, oh, we just talked a couple, like it was like four (laughs) weeks ago. (laughs) Um, So right now I'm really just taking it day by day. And I don't know. I mean, everybody I think has noticed the amount of content on Instagram is increasing tenfold and just on all social channels. So, you know, I'm looking at what other people are doing and and either trying to emulate or trying to come up with things that are catching. So for tarot, um, I've started a weekly tarot reading on Tuesday evenings. Um, This afternoon, 
I'm doing a live photo styling with a friend who owns a studio in Northern California for tarot. So she's going to kind of walk through the photo styling process. So really just trying to find ways to like reach new uh, consumers and keep them engaged and give them a little more background about the brand. Um, also looking at direct mail as an option. Everybody is stuck at home right now. And this came to me yesterday afternoon. I got like a little mailer from Derm Store, which is like a skincare uh, website. And I was just like, you know what? I would normally just throw this away, but right now I'm just like looking for anything to do and anything to read. And I was like, I actually like sat and looked at it. I went on the website and I was like, huh, I should be doing this. So yeah. um, we'll hopefully be getting a direct mailer to you uh, <laughs> in the next couple of weeks. So, you know, it's really just about like thinking back to what we did pre-event or how to take an event online. So it's, it's definitely been tricky, though, with the amount of content that's happening. It's true. And I feel like there's more because there's all of a sudden. And I think I don't know if I'm noticing it because I see it more like and probably you too, like being in marketing, you just see the ramp up of content increased and videos increased by I saw a number last week that was like 50%. And that was just last week. So that's crazy. Yeah. And so there's just a lot more opportunity, but there's also makes it harder to stand out. Um, and I think that, you know, looking at reassessing all of the channels, like you're just saying, is really important because most people need to see something five times. Usually the number used to be five times in five different places, right? Mm -hmm. um, so whether that's, you know, you know, and when we're limited to online, what do those places look like? How do we get in front of people's faces <laughs> and in their homes? And I think a big piece of that too is looking at similar brands or people that are aligned with your brand values. Mm -hmm. And then I've been mm -hmm. reaching out to people to see like how we can work together to create and capitalize on both of our audiences. So I think that's something that a lot of people don't think about. Like even other CBD companies, I you know I follow a lot of CBD companies. I love watching them. I love watching them grow. I still think there's a lot of room in this market for all of us. So like reaching out to them and being like, how can we work together? Yeah. Like, yes, we do sell similar products, but like, it doesn't matter. Let's do this. Let's find a way to make this work for both of us. So I love it. And I think that's such an important attitude because everyone is going to benefit by having more information. Everyone's going to benefit by there being the right information and the right alignment with brands with the person. So I feel like there's so much misinformation when it comes to CBD. And then there's a lot of, you know, when people are doing the hemp oil to try and get around some of the, the limitations for advertising, it starts to get tricky and it's confusing to consumers. It does. And I recently had my Facebook ad accounts reinstated. Oh, congratulations. Um, after, <laughs> thank you. After, I don't even know how many appeals, but even now as I'm boosting posts or I'm creating ads, it's a 50 50 shot of whether they actually make it past their review process. And it's funny because their review process, I would love to see what they actually do because it's like, I post it and like 30 seconds later it's accepted or rejected. And so I don't know if it's like an actual person or a bot scanning it. Um, but what I'm finding is just leaving the words like hemp or CBD out of the entire advertisement itself is like the safest way to go. Um, but, you know, then it's really frustrating because you see a lot of brands that, like, the other day I saw a CBD vaporizer that was doing ads and showing their product. And I was like, well, how can this person do this? And I can't post a picture of, like, right. just my packaging. <laughs> and I've, I've heard I've heard both ways. So I've heard there's, like, a bot scan of ads and then a human, a manual person. So I've heard that it's just strictly manual and I've heard there's a, a word scan and then the manual person. So I don't know the exact answer to that. Um, AJ Wilcox was here last week talking about LinkedIn ads and that's completely manual as well. Um, yeah, so it is interesting because, and it, that is part of, I know from my own experience in running cannabis ads, I was able to get some pass through but it honestly I could run the same ad in two different geographies and you know the one in Seattle for example went through without a problem but the one in San Francisco the person who was checking it said no and the only difference yeah. was the image you know I made relevant from Seattle to San Francisco like there's nothing else that was different and it's just it's strictly that gray area of whoever you get to appeal it makes and so with the appeals, what I do is I send screenshots and links to the ads 
mm-hmm. of other people. I'm like, well, if this person can do this, why can I not do this? And smart. that usually changes their tune fairly quickly. Smart. That's really smart. Yeah. Um, I do have a question for you. You know, one of the things that we wanted to talk about is, you know, it, this leads us straight into no being negotiable. I know that in the marketing that you've done and some of the campaigns and things you've done, you have some great experience and pushing up against people who are telling you no the first time. Can you talk a little bit about that and how you've been able to work through that besides just the appeals you were just talking about? (laughs) Um, Honestly, I think for me, like when somebody tells me no, I have such a solution oriented brain that I'm like, okay, but what if we did it like this? You know, and, and so really trying to think before you even have the conversation with somebody about all of the solutions or all of their responses and having, you know, uh, a response to what they're going to say. And then there's also the idea that, like, that one person is telling you no, maybe because they're scared and they don't understand what you're trying to do. So go to somebody else um, and, and continue going to somebody else until you the right person or until you get to the actual decision maker that's going to tell you no so it's a constant you know a constant conversation until you get to the right person until you get that final no where you're like okay the vp of marketing told me no like, <laughs> i can't really go any further that's this. so but for me it's, you know i just i believe in what i'm doing so strongly and i get so obsessed with ideas that i'm just like let's continue. Let's keep going. Let's push the boundaries. It's going to be okay. Um, also just listening to people. Right. Listening to their fears. And that's what it is. Is the fear of what if, right? The what if scenarios. I think I do the same thing like, okay, well you said no, but what if we did it this way and like just keep throwing ideas against the wall to see what's going to stick and what's going to work to get past that and and honestly help dissipate that fear that a lot of people have, whether it's more education or getting creative or taking the responsibility off of them. So if anything happens, it's like all of those things, I think. You had a great example when we spoke before about, was it an airline ad? Yeah. So when I was at WikiLeaf, I had this grandiose idea that we were going to be the first company uh, to run an airline ad um, actually in the back of the screen. So it was a commercial. And everybody was like, you're nuts. No one's going to fly. <laughs> like, it's never going to happen. And I was like, no, 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 no. Like, let's think about how we can approach this. Because at that time, this was, what, three years ago. Cannabis was still, I mean, it, it's opened up so much more in the last three years than it was then. And, oh, crazy. and that was like, right the same time that that TSA article came out that said that they're not really checking for <laughs> and I was like well this is great <laughs> I can work with this and so I reached out to I don't even know how many airlines like all major airlines and I ended up um, working with Virgin which is no longer it's part of Alaska and creating a PSA that was all about uh, find pot where you land don't bring it on the plane with you um, because WikiLeaf was an online you know cannabis finder Mm -hmm. and price comparison tool and so you know but it took a lot of time and a lot of different approaches and a lot of people and a lot of conversations to get there were you able to make sure that that only ran on flights between states that were legal or did they did that matter in the long run they opened it up to all of their flights within the united states okay that's great yeah that's really interesting real feedback was that they had to control the creative right and so it was like not what i wanted um (laughs) if you like see the commercial which i should try and find a link to it like the bag is like dried parsley it's not even pot and i was just like you guys could have got something a little better (laughs) (laughs) but anyway it was a win it was a win take what you can get (laughs) the next time will be better (laughs) <laughs> That's hilarious that they filmed it with dry parsley. <laughs> like, oh my gosh. No actual pot was used in the making of this video. Um, you know, one of the other things that we had talked about is really going back to our conversation about the more places someone sees your message, the more likely they are to remember it and then it'll start to resonate with them. Um, I know that, you know, you mentioned direct mail, but can we talk about email a little bit? I know you've done a lot with email and it's such an important medium still 
even though people yeah. think it's very 1999 or 2005. <laughs> sure. Um, so I send out around three email blasts a week. I have all of my audiences segmented. So what that means is just based off of uh, the reports that, so, so basically when I'm segmenting audiences, what I'm doing is like, I'll send out a blast and then I'll send out a similar blast with some of the same information. And from that, I'll start to be able to figure out what people are clicking on and what they're interested in. So then I can segment those audiences based off of their wants. Mm -hmm. Um, I send out three emails a week, none of which that are really sales oriented. They're all information, education, or personal. So awesome. I, I need kind of like a bucket and a blend. Um, with all of the spare time on our hands with COVID, I've actually been writing a lot of blog posts, um, which has been really helpful in terms of email marketing. So um, I will say that over you know the past year, I feel like email open rates and click-through rates aren't as high as they used to be, and a lot of people expect sales. So in order to combat that, it's just coming up with better subject lines and, and, and catchy and quick or very detailed content. Subject, sweet spot. subject lines are always just so tricky. Like, I never thought that when I took journalism classes in college that they would be so important. Because, <laughs> like, half the class was all about the headline. And it's just, it's so crazy in terms of how important subject lines are. Yes. And then also the day that you send, like, mm -hmm. and the time that you send, and, 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 you know, all of that. But thankfully, with a lot of the email tools... Um, I use Clavio personally, you can actually capture all of that data to start to figure out when and how and where and who to send. Nice. To. Nice. Yeah, I've heard good things about Clavio. It's one that I've never used, but I know that Clavio, I use Active Campaign and Active okay. Campaign are the two that are the most cannabis and CBD friendly. So those of you guys using MailChimp, stop it. <laughs> I'm, on, I'm on a personal campaign to stop people from using MailChimp just because they've shut down so many so many people, so many businesses, accounts. Yeah, they've cut me down a few times. Clavio is really good because they have already pre-built in flows for like welcome series, abandoned oh, parts. So you don't nice. actually have to figure all of that out because that's just like a mess in itself. And then they also do email uh, capture pop-ups for your website. So it's Perfect. kind of like an all-in-one tool. It is slightly more expensive. Right. Um, but for all the features, I found it's just worth it because it saves me hours of nice yeah nice yeah i've been a big fan of active campaign because of the um automation and then the crm yeah. aspects of it um but it's great to hear that you're using email and that it's been effective for you even with the changes um segmentation so important and like understanding what content people want to be reading is such a skill yes and and through that like i use um SEMrush to look at what people are, you know, so SEMrush is a tool that shows you uh, SEO results based off of keywords and search mm -hmm. terms. And so I mm -hmm. use that pretty frequently to try and figure out what it is that people are looking for up to minute. Obviously, right now, a lot of my content has been COVID based. Um, what can you do to help with stress, or, you know, plants that can help with immunity, Instagram accounts to follow, just lots of you know, things around our, our new normal, I should say. But um, I can't remember what your question was or what I was doing. <laughs> I just lost my <laughs> We were just talking about email. It's fine. It's good. How do you use the email to grow your business? Yes. I actually did also just recently try text message marketing. Oh, how did, what did um, you think of that? Um, it was, I mean, I, I only tried it for about a month before I was shut down because I have a CBD company. Right. Um, I've used it obviously with dispensaries that I've worked with and seen, you know, a good, a good amount of traffic and conversion, mm -hmm. but I wasn't able to use it long <clears throat> enough with Tara to, you know, garner the results. It was right. fun and it was like kitschy little messages that I was sending every day, just like words of, you know, affirmation and, and flash sales and things like that. So it is a good tool just linking it to CBD accounts is still iffy. And I think there are very specific um, text services that will allow for CBD and cannabis related um, businesses. Yeah. But, you know, of course, like everything else, they're probably twice the price when I looked at them before. <laughs> it's just so annoying. Um, 
one of the things like you have such a great brand too that you can play off of the tarot aspect of it so like your card reading and everything there's just so many different things you can do with that i love how many i love all the legs that it has <laughs> yeah, i've been working with a reader since december that's based in brooklyn and she's fantastic and i would like consider her a close friend now and it, even on Tuesdays, like if we're going live and like Justin Bieber is going live at the same time and we have like five people on, it's just great for us to sit down and have a conversation. <laughs> like, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that there's just so much to, there's so much opportunity. It's so funny you're talking about that. I'm presenting um, for Ecamm, which is the software I use for this show. I'm presenting at their live streaming workshop that's free at the end of this month. So that's a plug. I'll put the link in the comments. But it's all the different creative ways people are, my topics, the creative ways people are using to use live video for yeah. a regulated market and card reading. I've heard of people doing happy hours and drinks. And there's another woman who does card reading on Fridays as well. It just gives you so many opportunities, but it's so strong at being able to create that trust in that community. Um, I'm really excited. So this evening I'm doing a live photo shoot yeah. with uh, a friend who uh, has a design agency in Humboldt and company's called The Studio. Uh, and I'm excited because like I'm not there. So I'm actually watching my products be styled and shot too. So for me, it's like a treat as well. So we'll see how that goes. I think it's interesting to see the behind the scenes of the creative work Absolutely. that goes into it. She's fantastic. I just kind of let her run with things. Like I don't really give her any type of like path. I'm just like, you just do whatever feels good to you and let's see what happens. So I'm excited to, to be a part of that this evening. I love it. Um, when you were done with this, do you mind putting the link in the comments? So that way anybody that wants to check it out can go look at it as well. Um, cause I think that that's definitely something that is just fascinating, like being able to see how the styling works and the thought process behind it. Um, one of the other things that we wanted to talk about too, is the importance of really leaning on your network and working together collaboratively. So, you know, the rising tide lifts all ships, but really to be able to find those people, how do you, how do you decide who you're going to work with and collaborate with? And how do you go about that? Oh, man. Um, <laughs> there's so many different factors to that. So part of it is obviously budget. Like, I've self-funded this whole company. This is my only revenue stream personally to pay all of my bills. Um, so I you know, have to be cognizant of that. But when I'm choosing people to work with, I tend to always choose to work with women. Um, I don't, I don't know if that needs a huge explanation, but I also try and, you know, work with women who are either just starting their career or are looking for help and advice around how to build an agency or how to, like we were chatting about, like create social media marketing proposals. So like also people that I can help build and flourish. And so when I worked at WikiLeap, I managed a team. And what I always told my team is that if I still see you in two years, I did something wrong. Yeah. Like, I don't want to see you anymore. Like, you should be on me. You should be getting paid more. You should be off, like, being so successful. I feel that way now. So anytime I bring somebody on, I'm like, well, I love watching a female entrepreneur like yourself, and I want to help in any way, in any capacity. So that's really how I choose people to work with. Is like, how can I also support this woman and build their business? I love it. I love it. That's just so many things that I believe in as well. I mean, it's the whole reason also why I teach on the side too, is because how can I help continue? Like I love learning, but I also more than that, love being able to use that information to help other people thrive. Exactly. Um, exactly. And like, I'm not holding on to my contracts, like for my statement of works. Like if you want to see an example of it, ask me if you want to, you know, ask what to charge, like, you know, it's not going to hurt my business to help somebody else is how I see it. I love it. I love it. Um, do you have any other tips or examples when it comes to really getting creative with your marketing or campaigns um, that could help other people, women or people who are watching? Um, this is something that I've struggled with is don't be scared to humanize your brand. Right. So I have a hard time with like self promotion. I always feel like my work should stand alone and that it doesn't need a face figure attached to it. I realize that that's like completely impossible unless you have a huge budget. 
somebody if somebody can prove me wrong please please send that my way so uh, humanizing i think is one of the easiest ways to really create a community community around what you're doing so anytime i you know post a video talking about education or post a photo of myself sharing pieces of my own story it gets far more engagement than an actual product photo and then also just living by the 80 20 rule of like 80 percent education fluffy content um conversational 20 percent sales like yeah. don't just continue to like shove your brand messaging and sales down people's throats like give them something more give them something to believe in give them a story absolutely and no one wants to know no one wants to be sold to nonstop. but if you can do, create the story around your brand and actually to your point humanize it which is not easy it's always the advice no. i give to everybody else but it is hard well and it's like <clears throat> you see people who are humanizing brands but coming from a marketing background, you're like, is that actually real? And so, like, I come from a very blue collar working class family, everything that I have is self made. And I did, you know, scrappy. And, you know, the other day posted about being on food stamps a couple years ago, and I'm doing a choose what you pay option on tarot, because I know people can't access CBD right now. And it's just like, I get that. Like, but do people want to know that? Does that make my brand less desirable? Because I don't, you know, portray this perfect life like yeah it, it's so weird you know it's like this fine balance it really is it really is and i think that it's one like for me all of my entire career and i think that's an interesting it's probably the biggest challenge that i didn't expect when i started my business my entire career like i'm always the one behind the scenes like here's the yeah. university i'm working for here's the technology or the crm platform whatever it is that i'm marketing it's not about me and yeah. and I think the hardest shift that I've had to make is that it's still not about me. It's about yeah. the people I'm trying to help, right? Exactly. It's about my students. It's about my clients. It's about everyone, you know, viewers. It's still not about me. But I think that that and like humanizing it, but still not keeping it about me is the balance that I've had to try in. Yeah, it's and, hard. And make really for sure. Yeah. Um. Okay, so are you ready for the speed round? Um, yes. Okay, I've got some very, very important questions for you, and I always threaten to get bring on some music, some of the Jeopardy music, but I have not <laughs> figured out how to do that yet. Totally free, so I'm so bad at trivia. It's not <laughs> trivia. These are all your personal like, questions. Like, like quick. Like, okay. Okay, I can do this. All right, you've got it. You've got it totally under control. What are your, that's speed question number one, what are your favorite cannabis products or brands? Um, brands. Oh my gosh. Well, we don't, oh, ooh, ooh, ooh. Um, and if I it's love... flower strain too, that's an option as well. Yeah. So I've just found this new strain called Blue Delta. I'm also like a huge lover of bubble gum. Mm. Bubble gum is like favorite strains. Um, there is a edible company in Oregon that makes chocolate covered marshmallows and I cannot think of the name of it. And they're so good. Oh, that sounds good. Um, and then really basic. I love Wana gummies. Like they're all over and you can find them and they're accessible and they're consistent. And they're good. And they're good. And they're good. Okay. What books, publications, podcasts are you currently consuming? Oh, that's an embarrassing question. So I, <laughs> I uh, have listened to four or five eBooks in the past week. Um, podcast. This is really embarrassing. They're all murder podcast. <laughs> so I'm like crime junkie and serial killers. Um, I do listen to so retrograde, which is not murder, but it's still good. Mm-hmm. Um, anything sci-fi related. So like there's one right now called like Toulon Bay. That's kind of like a weird sci-fi. Nice. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then books. Um, I have Kindle Unlimited, which is you. I want. I call it like the B list of books. No, I just like got it. Movie. I'm doing the same thing. <laughs> Crappy half romance, half mystery novels, and I just like eat those up. I can read an entire book. In <coughs> I feel like we have the same reading list right now. Yeah. I've got a list of business books, but I don't. I don't. I'm not good at reading business books. I have to make myself read them. But the, yes, the crime genre, yeah, 
I started reading my friend's book. Um, my friend Kara Davis has a bunch of like mystery chick lit books, which are awesome. And so I've been rereading some of her books. <laughs> And it's awesome because I've known her since junior high. So it's even fun to like, A, support my friend, B, let her entertain me. And that way I don't have to call her and make her tell me stories. I can just read hers. <laughs> Do you ever see parts of her in her own books? Like her? Sometimes, sometimes. And I did have to have a conversation with her because we actually lost touch for a while. And she wrote in a character who worked at a sex shop who ended up getting killed. But that character's name was Kendra. So I was like... So, <laughs> if you're going to use, I know it's not me, but if you're going to use my name, can you not kill her off right away? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that. It was pretty funny. I'm like, I know I haven't talked to you in a couple of years, but now I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but she, her books are great and highly, they're fun for sure. Um, okay. And then my last question for you on the not so speedy round is what was your inspiration for your brand? So I love your logo. I love the packaging. I keep showing it off. I've been keeping it near my computer, which makes it hard to take it to use at night, but I've been using it. Like I keep demonstrating like just how, whoops, sorry, camera's over here. Like just how gorgeous and thoughtful your brand is to all the little like points. It's hard to see in the light, sorry. But like you've covered every single element of it. Um, what was your inspiration? So two fun facts. One, um, my boyfriend actually designed the packaging. Mm -hmm. He's a really talented designer. So it was, a, you know, a thoughtful cool. process together. But um, the tarot aspect and the astrology aspect is really like my personal belief in that everything happens for a reason and that you should be pay attention, like paying attention to the signs. So if something consistently is either telling you yes or no in the universe, watch that listen to it and make decisions based off of your gut and so for me it was when i was creating tarot um i was going through a lot of stuff just with my agency and with my personal health and just a lot of things shifting and what i did is i just sat back and really you know thought about paid attention to and, and created a path based off of what i was seeing around me um, and so that's kind of where the inspiration come, came from. And then my boyfriend, uh, well, his really great friend did the branding and then my boyfriend took the branding and put it into the packaging. So um, it's been a labor of love. <laughs> I love it. And that just jumped on to say that the packaging is gorgeous. And it is. It absolutely is. And I love that it's cardboard. There's just so many things that I love about it that um, environmentally friendly. I just love the packaging and your branding. It's just beautiful. The only piece that you cannot recycle is the rubber dropper, and I cannot find a substitute for that. So if anybody knows of a substitute for that, the, like, oh. send it my way. Um, but everything else recycled can actually fold the glass off of the rubber. Um, I love it. Um, last week in the so separate show, which is where I interviewed Kate the first time, is in the Women on Empowered in Cannabis CBD group. And last week we had Lily Kaninen on and she is the person that I go to anytime I'm looking for sustainable packaging or anyone has questions for sustainable packaging and she is with changemakercreative.com um and so she's the go-to person because I know she's she's it's her one of her value propositions is that she's always looking for sustainable packaging and sustainability and so she goes a very long way to try and research and find people who are are building those types of things. So I, she would be, she was, she's always my go-to for questions like that. I'm like, Oh, Lily will know. <laughs> Very cool. Um, and I'll drop her, her link in the, in the notes as well. All right. That is my last question for you, Kate. I appreciate your time and you being here. I love what you're doing and thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much for having me, and I hope that we get a chat again really soon. Absolutely. And you guys, thank you for sticking with us and watching. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments, and Kate and I will go back through and respond. And thank you guys for being here. Have a great rest of your day. Yeah.